Okay, this might be a trigger warning for you, but have you ever felt worse when you left church than before you got there? Or do you feel like you need to be medicated just to go in the doors? <sighs> if you have ever felt this way, then this message is for you. Well, hello, hello, my silky friends. I Look, I hate doing this. I cover true crime, but the things that are coming out are crimes. And, you know, I was studying the case of Micah Miller and her husband, JP, who I feel like is, you know, in my opinion, allegedly, he is a narcissist and probably a malignant one. And, you know, there's a lot of things going on with that case. And the Meantime, you have all of these other scandals breaking, and it seems like there is one big theme that is going across the church, and it is narcissism. So I'm like, how is this allowed? Like, why don't we see the signs? God? Hello, where are you? Why didn't you warn me? Well, he did. But let's look at the subtle signs of a covert narcissist, because I think this is going to help you. And I'm sorry, if your pastor turns out to be one, well, at least you know. Okay, the first big sign of covert narcissism is a lack of accountability. And you may say, my pastor doesn't act like that. Well, here is what I mean. Do they resist being held accountable? Do they create a structure where they're at the top and there's very little oversight? Do they surround themselves with yes men? These are all things we should really look at. Okay, are they like the, the grand poobah? Like what they say goes, no matter what. Do you have a board of deacons or elders or whatever kind of accountability structure that they actually listen to and abide by? Or do they just, you know, push it off? Well, you know, brother, I understand your position, but this is my decision. No, you are a body. You are a body. Okay. But if you have somebody who doesn't listen and they're not going to write the vision and the vision is just like, okay, wherever, wherever the spirit leads me today, you know, where we're going this year. And like, look, there's got to be accountability in the body and People who don't want accountability surround themselves with elders or board members that are yes people. They're maybe either personal friends or they're in some kind of authority over them in some other part of their life. And you already know that whatever the pastor says is going to go because they are surrounded with yes men. If you want to stay holy, if you want to stay on target, then you need to pick somebody, at least one, if not two, or more. You need to pick somebody who is on your accountability board who you know is not afraid to speak the truth. You know, sister so-and-so, Lord help us all. She ain't, she gonna say whatever she wants to say. She don't care. You know, you, it might be aggravating, but sister so-and-so, she's a gem. When it comes to decision making. Okay, the next thing that you need to look out for is do they deflect criticism? Now, what I mean by this is they have difficulty receiving constructive feedback. When you criticize them or correct them, narcissistic pastors respond with anger, defensiveness, denial, or they try to manipulate and make the other person feel guilty rather than exhibiting humility. Okay, those are all nice words, but what does that actually mean? Can you give me some examples? Like, how do I know? I'm glad you asked. Denial. You are misunderstanding me. Oh my goodness, sister, I didn't mean that. I don't know where you got that idea. That is not what I meant. You're just, you are so misunderstanding where we're going here. I think you need to, you know, pray about it. Let the Lord speak to you because I don't think you have a good understanding of what I'm talking about. I guess it's me then, right? I'm so sorry. Defensiveness. You do not realize the stress I am under. All right, here's a good one. You know, I'm just overwhelmed. Maybe I don't make perfect decisions. I'm not perfect. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And you don't understand the stress I have on me. 
like I've got all this, I've got family problems, I've got the church, and you know, I'm just doing the best I can. And I feel like you're just attacking me. No, nobody's attacking you, Pastor. We're asking you a question. Why can't you answer it without getting defensive? This isn't a personal attack. So where are you going with this? Anger. <sighs> Anger might be something like, I give and I give and nobody appreciates it. You don't know. How many nights I pace the floor and I'm crying and I'm on my knees, on my face before Almighty God, praying and crying and, and interceding for, for you all. And I know, you know, I'm crying out to God for mercy. I know your sins. You don't know what I am going through. You have, you are just making judgments and you don't know what my relationship is with God. And you don't know where my face is and what I'm doing at 3 a.m. while you're asleep. Okay, you know what? Maybe they are doing that. But if their heart is in the right place, probably not even going to tell you. You know, they're not going to get angry. They're going to say something constructive like, okay, you know, I see we've got a conflict here and maybe you're stressed, I'm stressed, whatever. Let's talk about this again. And if I'm wrong, even as a pastor... I'm going to say I'm wrong and thank you for bringing this to my attention because I was about to make a big mistake. But you see, a narcissist will not do that. A narcissist is not going to own that there is anything wrong with them. It, there's always a reason and it's going to make you feel bad. Like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize the pastor was under so much stress and I just added more to it. I really stink at this and now I'm depressed and I feel bad and I I'm gonna fix him a dinner and, and take it to their house or something because I just want to make up to him I'm just so sorry you see how the manipulation goes and then sometimes they'll throw some stuff on you well you know your attitude sister is not godly this is not one of humility women should be clothed in humility yeah so should the pastor okay that's in there too Look it up. Let's look at some other signs that are maybe a little bit easier to see if you're paying attention. Let's start with self-promotion. They like to make themselves the hero of illustrations and ensure that they remain the center of attention because they are the ones with the greatest revelation, right? So when they're up there talking or preaching, you know, it, it's okay to throw in a story. I throw in stories too when I'm, when I'm doing stuff. And, you know, you're just, you're sharing. But there's a difference in sharing an event that happened and using an illustration that makes you look, you know, greater than what you are. A story that goes something like, and I was in this place and I had just had a great dinner and I was feeling good and the Spirit of God came on me and showed me this homeless person down there and said that person is is hungry and they don't have proper shoes and here you are sitting here like a fat cat and I'm like oh God I am so sorry and so God told me you go give a thousand dollars and buy that uh, homeless person a meal okay that's a great story. I don't know if it's true or not. Or what the motivation was behind it. But I want to tell you something. That is not a story that you share in an open congregation. Why? Because it puffs you up. And then everybody's like, oh my goodness. Not only is the, the pastor able to hear God. And they humbled themselves and told us about their attitude and all this stuff. And then they gave all that money. What a good man that is. I don't know if I could have done that or not. I'm scared of homeless people. Do you see what I'm saying though? The Bible says when it comes to money and it comes to doing stuff. Like your left hand. Wait, that's my right hand. Your left hand shouldn't know what your right hand is doing. But now everybody knows what you're doing. If you even did it. Because I wonder sometimes. But when you are bringing yourself up to be the hero of a situation. That's some narcissism right there. You are taking away the God. You're taking away from him and talking about you. Now. 
do we get distracted as public speakers and stuff? Yeah, sure we do. But if it is a recurrent theme and you are always leaving there thinking, wow, the pastor is an awesome man. I mean, he really has the revelation. Nobody else does because he's going to tell you. I started this church with a word from God. It was a direct prophecy. Hey, we saw that with Mike Bickle a few months ago, right? We saw this whole thing because of this word from God. And I'm not saying it is or isn't. I don't know. I wasn't there and I'm not God. And I can't judge that word. But what I can say is it doesn't matter. If that was the word, the sin superseded that, okay? The sin made you disqualified to carry out that word, all right? The secret sin, because I, I had a discussion with somebody about this. Look, none of these people are coming out because they just had an attack of conscience, right? Conscience. You know what? I realized that God is on my heart. And I know I'm, I'm miserable unless I confess. No, they're confessing because they're busted. There's a big difference. Grace doesn't extend to the busted. Because that is not repentance. You're not sorry you sinned. You're sorry you got caught. Huge difference. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is a sign of narcissism. All right, here's another big one. They isolate themselves. Now, you might not see this as much. You have to really look for it. They do not develop any authentic vulnerability or accountability with a small group of trusted friends, and they make it difficult for the layman to speak with them. Okay, so you should have very close, and I look, I'm not saying a pastor, especially of a very large congregation, should have a ton of people in the inner circle or anybody for that matter. No, you need to keep your inner circle small, but accountable people who are going to make you be accountable. But when you don't have that, or you say you have that, but you're really not vulnerable with them, are you not telling them what you're really struggling with or the outer stuff you're struggling with? What sins, what temptations, you have to have someone you can trust. Like the Bible says to confess our sins one to another. Now, don't just go out here telling everybody your sins. That's dumb. Don't do it. But you need to have people who are trustworthy that can help you and will keep you accountable. Now, another thing that they do, and I saw this in a church where it was a very small congregation. There was probably less than 100 people that came on Sundays. And our children's minister kept complaining to me, like, I can never talk to the pastor. Like, they won't talk to me after church or before church. They, they call and make an appointment. And it was very difficult because she had small kids. It's like, I really, I don't have to talk that long. I just need to have a conversation with the pastor, you know about the kids ministry and some stuff that's on my mind and all my friend got was you know the secretary saying the pastor's not in pastor's busy blah 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 and after a couple of months this children's leader she was just she was fed up and she felt unappreciated which she was and undervalued and the, the pastor was way up here they're just too busy you only got a hundred people on the congregation you can't be that busy. And this is your only job. Like this pastor didn't have another job. That was it. And you can't talk to one of the leadership. You can't make time for them. Okay, but they were already building this principle of distance. I'm up here and you're down here. You see how that works? It's a problem because the kingdom of God is flat, right? You have different positions. You're all equally important. It takes everybody. Here's a favorite one. They like to twist the scriptures. Now, we always hear about this, twisting scriptures, blah, blah, blah. But it's true. They bend a scripture to mean what they want it to mean in their context. All right. And have you ever heard a scripture over and over? I mean, like, and I'm embarrassed to say this, but I have. There are certain ones I've heard forever. And, you know, it, it sounds right. It sounds like it goes with the principles of what we know is true but have you ever like just been reading the bible and then you come across that scripture and you realize it is somewhere weird like well this is the scripture i always heard meant this because that's what it sounds like but you look at it in the context of the chapter and the story that you're reading 
And you're like, that's not what that scripture means. I mean, it's similar, but it really doesn't mean what I've been taught for the last 20 years that it means. So if they're using scripture to twist, to exonerate themselves, or they're even saying, well, you know, we live in grace. We live in the age of grace and God knows. Yeah, God knows, but God is not going to just go, yeah, I'm busy. I don't have time to look at that. No, you're going to be held accountable for that. And the word of God doesn't change. And it certainly doesn't change for you. And it doesn't change to, you know, promote the church. All right, so what is the last signs subtle? We're not even into the big signs. We're into the subtle signs of a narcissist and church leadership. They foster disunity. Boy, this is a big one. Whew. Okay, they create a culture of secrecy, negativity, and infighting within the congregation by pitting people against each other and sowing disunity. Again, you're thinking that, that, that's like a word salad. Well, let's break it down, okay? Let's silky talk it. What it means is they are causing trouble in the church and making it look like somebody else. And you're, you're all confused. All right, this is often a term that they call triangulation. All right, you say something, you don't actually talk to the third person. You've got somebody over here on the outskirts that wants to say something to you, but there's a person in the middle. Somebody says, Pastor, I need to talk to you about the worship team. And you say, well, I, I need you to talk. Why don't you talk to my secretary? Why don't you talk to this elder first? He's over this. Let's, let's you know... And then kind of give them the rundown and they'll tell me. Well, it never really gets a straight message. Because what you tell this in-between party and what they tell the pastor and back and forth. Because the pastor is manipulating all this. Because the point is, I don't want to actually have to answer your question. Or be accountable or talk to you about whatever it is that I think could go sideways. Here's another example of triangulation. All right, so you're talking to the pastor after church. Everybody's milling around. And let's just call her Sister Daisy. Sister Daisy comes up to the pastor and she's like, Oh, hello, pastor. That was a great message. You know, I enjoyed it. I hope you have a beautiful afternoon. Blah, blah, blah. Sister Daisy walks away. You don't have a problem with Sister Daisy. And then as you and the pastor are sitting there, you know, he kind of says hello to you, something like, you know, I love that Sister Daisy, but we have a meeting on Thursday, and it's about the finances, and I tell you what, she is so hard to deal with. She's a good person. I know she's got a good heart, but she is so hard to deal with, and I am not looking forward to this. She just argues about everything. Okay. So you don't really even know Sister Daisy that well. You just see Sister Daisy walking around, you know, being joyful and helpful or whatever she is. And all of a sudden, you have a different perception of Sister Daisy. Because the pastor has taken you into their confidence. Like, you feel special. He leaned over and he just said, oh, pray for me because this meeting's coming up. This woman going to drive me nuts, you know, in that, that way, but in a nice way, he lets you know there's something wrong with Sister Daisy. You never noticed it. You never thought about it, but now the pastor is telling you this, so now you're going to be watching Sister Daisy for any kind of, hmm, that might be going on. It's causing a culture of mistrust, and it is, again, putting the pastor up on a pedestal so if something does come down something d bad does happen in the meeting you are are gonna already know oh well yeah he warned me about that you see what i'm saying they are not straightforward and nobody should be telling you uh you know it's not gossip if you're asking for prayer right oh this ain't gossip honey they need some prayer that's the way we do it in the south I'm, I'm just being truthful. All right, so these are the subtle signs. And what are the big signs? Because when we're talking about the Micah Miller case and we're talking about Pastor JP, and let's just put all of the people 
on on you know that have fallen and have caused shenanigans lately let's put them all on this they are not covert narcissists they probably started out that way or you have to be in the church but we're going to talk about the big signs of narcissism next time and how to avoid them and how do you confront them what do you do what do you do we'll talk about it later I hope you all have a great rest of the day. Stay safe and whatever you do. What? What? Stay silky. Bye-bye.